Welcome to the Business Model Sandbox, where leaders come to explore and test entire new business models, not just tweaks or incremental change to the way things work today, but entirely new models that transform how we create, deliver, and capture value. I'm Saul Kaplan. I'm the founder and chief catalyst at BIF, and I'm your host for the Business Model Sandbox. Each month, we have one of the leading thinkers and doers uh, in the transformation space. And this month, a little different uh, than we've done in the past, I actually have with me today, here at BIF, Ben Siegel, who just joined us. In fact, today was really the first full day uh, that uh, Ben was here, uh, who now actually works uh, for BIF as our chief impact officer. Uh, ben is a, a crazy cool millennial. He's a social impact entrepreneur. He brings uh, an incredible, if, 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 if you can, Call a millennials experience base incredible, certainly extensive, uh, uh, kind of track record in thinking about new social impact models and how we can use emerging technology to do it. Ben, welcome to the Business Model Sandbox. Welcome to BIF. <laughs> Thank you for having me. It's a, it's a great introduction. Um, if you can call millennials experienced, I. I tend to shy <laughs> away from go that there. one. Um, no, that, that opens up a whole can of worms. That is, we're, we're, but it's a can of worms that we really welcome here at Biff. It, it, I already feel younger, uh, just uh, uh, since we got to know each other. This isn't a job interview. Uh, there's some perspectives that you bring that are really important to share uh, with our broader community, uh, and so I wanted to have you uh, directly on the podcast uh, here. Uh, let's uh, let's 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 kick it off. First of all, uh, do you think of yourself that way, uh, a social impact entrepreneur? Is, uh, do you identify that way? Um, I have never successfully found the business. I've tried. So yes, I, th I think yes. And I know that it's something I want to do down the line, um, officially, but and I have had the pleasure and the honor of working with and supporting and advising um, a number of incredible social entrepreneurs, um, people who I really look up to, um, some of my closest friends and people who I'm just super happy to always support and work alongside. Um, I, it's hard to say if I would identify as a social entrepreneur yet. Um, this whole kind of- Entrepreneurial. Entrepreneurial, maybe, yeah. I, I, <laughs> I spend most of my time thinking, or falling down rabbit holes and thinking up like crazy things that are never going to work and no one is ever going to want, but I think are cool. Um, so I think that maybe counts as, as social entrepreneurial. Um, it does. Yeah. Yeah, no, it does. Let, let's talk, let's start uh, off by talking about uh, social impact. You have some really interesting perspectives on how we think about social impact today and how we probably need to be thinking about it uh, going uh, forward. Yeah. Um, this is maybe my like my my social my I think my social entrepreneur thesis and social impact thesis is that uh, specifically entrepreneurship and social entrepreneurship needs to be um, very communal, very growth oriented, and not exploitative or extractive. So um, to me, social entrepreneurship and especially around emerging tech is how do we go into how do we help facilitate the growth and expansion of traditional, traditionally underserved communities, underserved populations, um, in a manner in which the populations are the ones developing technology, developing business models, um, capital that's being invested into communities is staying in communities and it's not, f like, f wealth isn't fleeing um, back to the VC's pockets. I think that impact, and, and this is something we actually talked about off camera before we got on here, but social impact and social entrepreneurship is often, um, you know, what is the best way to support people? And it's not necessarily, I'm building a new piece of technology that's going to um, activate, you know, positive 
agriculture in, in the Amazon for the next 500 years, like that's awesome. But at the same time, social entrepreneurship could very much be, um, I'm going to go found like a, a local mom and pop shop that solely serves or solely employs underprivileged populations or um, donates 50% of its profit to the local orphanage or kind of like any type of work or outcome that is specifically focused and you have a, uh, a mission towards positive outcomes in your community. Yeah, what, um, uh, you know, you and I have talked before, you know, I didn't come from this world, although I I've been deep in it now here at BIF uh, for a number of years, uh, and I often scratch my head uh, around people who identify in the whole social entrepreneurial space, who I think sometimes are, are we're our own worst enemies because we create our own silo, thinking that we're going to solve the really hard problems in the world for people who most need the help and we're going to do that in our own swim lane you know absent collaboration with other folks that are in other sectors and i think sometimes these labels you know get, get in the way of doing it you don't seem to shy away from the notion that we have to capture value if we're going to solve hard social problems yeah and and i think a lot of that has to do with social innovation and social entrepreneurship has to be sustainable. Um, going into a community and running a program that lasts for a year or two years or six months, but then you leave and it falls apart, um, have you actually had that much of an impact? Like maybe you have, but your impact doesn't sustain, it doesn't, uh, it hasn't snowballed, it doesn't grow exponentially, it doesn't facilitate um, tertiary or secondary or tertiary outcomes in the community. It really is focused on this program does X, we go in, we run the program, we get out. Um, and I think that mindset is, uh, I don't want to say old world, but it, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's somewhat imperialistic in its mindset, um, which is maybe worse than old world, but uh, this, this kind of notion that the way to provide positive outcomes and positive incomes is to just go into a community and give them our learnings and our technology um, is very different than acknowledging that the best way to empower a community is to say, okay, we want to help educate with skills, we want to impart our skills, um, but we want to make sure that they are then being utilized in a manner that makes sense for the community. And when we leave or when our program ends, the skills and the trainings or the technology that we've deployed alongside the local community or developed alongside the local community um, continues to grow and expand and continues to aid and the communities or the underprivileged populations have ownership of it. Um, they are the ones who are you know, going to turn this from a small project that took us four months into um, a, a project that impacts hundreds of thousands of peoples, if not millions of peoples in their local region um, over the course of 10 or 15 years. Um, and making sure that the learnings that are being taken from that are continue to be activated on and, and grown and, and re-implemented in, in similar areas. Um, but I think oftentimes we find ourselves in these traps of thinking about entrepreneurship or social entrepreneurship or social impact as, as you said, I'm gonna go in and do X, Y, and Z. Um, and it, it, it's almost competitive in a sense. Um, and I think that this is, and I mean, we've talked about this in privately, but like my, one of my big interests is social finance and, and specifically social entrepreneurship finance. Um, and right now, a lot of the concepts around social innovation and social entrepreneurship and the way that they could finance is almost as if it's treated as a, uh, a very traditional venture capital deal right. um, one way or another where um, I need you as the person that I'm investing in to have the most competitive and the best solution. And you're gonna make me the most money. Um, and I think almost at the outset of that, not even almost, at the outset of that, there are a number of biases that affect your ability to actually have the most impact because you are driven to not be collaborative. You're driven to push out your competitors. You're driven, driven to make the most returns for your investors. Um, and you're driven to sell your company because that's what your, your VCs want. That's what your investors want. Um, and recently there's been kind of this movement towards, okay, like what does collaborative investment look like? What does collaborative entrepreneurship look like? If I'm going, if my project is going to be, or sorry, let me, let me step back and rephrase that. If I am an impact investor or an impact financer, I don't want to just invest in a company. I want to invest in 
all of the things around inside that company that are not only going to make that company successful, but make that company's impact as grand as possible. Yeah, so let's uh, let's play with that here. Let's start with the impact, and then uh, and then I want to go deeper into the what does impact investing and finance look like. But start with just the basic. Everybody's talking today, and the word impact is everywhere. All of a sudden, it's as if you know everybody's oh, we're trying to maximize impact. Mm -hmm. But I, I think we have to unbundle that word. What do we mean by impact? How, are we thinking the same about what impact is? Because I, I think you're right. You know, for too many people, we create proxies, right, that are about us, or about programs, about you know things we deliver and how many people were part of our program, and then and we say that's impact. But I think you mean something different by by impact. Um, I. I don't believe that any two people on this planet have the same definition of impact. I think there's probably a lot totally of similarities, right. but uh, you know, there are arguments about whether healthcare or energy projects are impact, are social impact. Um, some people say that the only way to do social impact is humanitarian aid. Some people like it really depends on the context, um, and you find organizations struggling with this as well and having difference of opinion. Um, I, I think to me. Quite literally, social impact is, am I facilitating an action or an outcome that is improving the lives of others? Um, am I nonprofit? Sure, that's awesome. Am I making millions of dollars off of this? Sure, that's awesome. But are you and is your mission and vision driven by the impact you're having on others and is your core focus on improving the lives of those in your community or those around you? Um, that could be through employment opportunities, that could be through creating more solar plants, that could be through um, improving healthcare options. Uh, it might be through the development of like skate parks for local kids in underprivileged regions to learn how to skateboard. Um, it's like, how are you positively affecting those people around you? And I think it's, it's to me, really simple that it, the intent and the outcome matter far more than the actual action. It seems like it should be that simple, right? In, in making a real measurable difference in the world for a person who has an actual problem yeah. or a challenge and something that they're trying to solve and helping somebody accomplish that, you know, and measuring impact that way. Well, it seems so simple, but yet you're absolutely right. I agree with you. There's no, everybody you talk to has a different definition of, it, of what it is. And then no wonder we're all over the place in terms Terms of trying to align for impact, um, so I think we have to do that uh, differently. I'm, I'm certain what gets in the way of that is we we measure what we think we can be successful at doing, and we try to claim victory for that, and we don't hold ourselves accountable for the actual problem we're trying to solve in the real world because sometimes it's hard to measure that and we do something that is an input to that but not the end goal of actually creating the impact. Uh, you know, I don't know, do you have any ideas of how we could get more alignment around what we even mean by impact? Uh, yeah. Can I say them out loud? Um, <laughs> uh, so I actually don't I don't think it's ever going to be, like impact metrics and standards are something that people have obviously struggled with for, I don't know, 50 years. Like what does it actually mean to have an impact on the ground? Are you measuring, like some people say, oh, you know, I've deployed $40 million into this region, that's an impact. And someone may come back to you and say, okay, cool, what is that money done? Like are there fewer, are there more women in school? Are there fewer teen pregnancies? Um, is there improved irrigation systems? Uh, is there less uh, malnutrition? Are there better health outcomes? Like, what are the actual outcomes of that? Um, and like, right there, those are two very different measures of impact, and people are always going to argue on them. Um, I know for me that I'm much more interested in the outcomes than the money deployed. Um, yeah. But I think that that mindset is changing right now, and I think there's a lot of people thinking about that. And um, I don't know if we'll ever get people to fully align on what's the, like the definition of impact. But I don't think it actually matters that much because as, if we have very different definitions of impact, but we're both working on things um, that are focused on actually improving the lives, I don't care if we have the same definition of what impact is. Like if I can look at you and say, okay, you know what, you are um, solely working on supporting environmental activists who are fighting logging in, in the redwood forests of California, like maybe that's not an issue that I super care about and I don't think that's super impactful, but I can at least identify why that's important or why that is having a positive effect on people. Um, and I think that as long as we're able to 
like as long as we're able to recognize positive outcomes without having a shared definition, yeah. uh, that I think that puts us in a pretty good place to like support and empower each other. Yeah, no, we don't have to work on the same uh, issues and we can define impact uh, for ourselves. But if we're gonna work together and we're gonna align ourselves to have impact, then we kind of have to agree on how we're gonna claim success. If we, if we wanna collaborate, and I'm gonna talk here in a second about how we finance it, like how do we attract the capital to it, mm -hmm. um, and let's do that. Let's uh, let's start talking a little bit about uh, the finance uh, here. Um, this is one of the most frustrating things uh, for me, and the observation of having come into the quote unquote you know social sector uh, here with a nonprofit at Biff, where I don't self identify uh, with that. When it came to how do we attract investment or capital, you know, and you go, you think about the usual suspects, right? You know, whether it's philanthropic investors or foundations or ways to actually bring capital, when you're not raising capital for a for-profit enterprise, right, it has become incredibly hard, right, to attract that kind of investment when you're really worried about impact in society, where you haven't proven that something works yet where you're trying to explore and to create a new model and you want to do something transformational, it becomes really hard to attract it. And I'm interested in kind of the evolving social impact world and how fast it's moving towards recognizing different ways of investing and aggregating capital in new ways mm -hmm. that, that old school dinosaurs like me you know, aren't uh, accustomed to. Yeah, so... I should just clarify and make a disclaimer before we go down this route. I am definitely not an impact investor, um, but have spent the majority of the last three years of my life working with different impact investors and being part of different impact investing communities. Um, I think traditionally impact finance has been seen as either government funding or philanthropic, and that's it, right? Like That's how everything has gotten funding. The UN, the US government, the Department of Foreign Affairs and in, in investment in the UK, ponies up money, USAID, whoever, or you go to the Rockefeller Foundation and they just give you money. Um, that's how traditional funding has been done for impact. Uh, I think what's been really fascinating over the last, when was, I think Rockefeller coined the term 10, 12 years ago, like the, the coin impact investing. Like 12 years, it's 12, 12, 12 years. 12 years, yeah. it's 10 or 12, yeah. Yep. We are going to invest for profit in social enterprises. Yep. Now we've got triple bottom line investing, we've got ESG investing, we've got you know all of these different things talking about investing. Um, Rockefeller Foundation, or not, not Rockefeller, May 2018 BlackRock report came out and said that uh, impact investing is as profitable as venture capital investing, we just don't know how to do it. Um, there's something like $22.8 trillion Someone fact check me on both of these numbers. There is something like $22.8 trillion locked up in, in sustainable investment strategies across the globe. Um, there is no definition about what a sustainable investment strategy is. There's, again, ESG, triple bottom line, impact investing. You know, um, They all have very patient capital. They all have very different meanings and different connotations, but they're all specifically or are targeted at impactful, impactful investments. Um, something like since... I think these numbers are actually from 2016, so I'm sure the numbers have changed a bit since then, but in the 10 years that impact investing has been around, um, only something like 200, I think $290 billion have actually been deployed um, as far as impact investments go. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with a misunderstanding about what makes an impact investment. Um, also a mindset that when you're impact investing, you are investing for profit and for return. Um, like investment first, impact second. And I think that mindset has to do with generally a, uh, an older approach to investing, like an investment is for return on profit. Um, and return should be seen, you know, you should be getting X percent return on your investment over this horizon. Um, I think right now what we're seeing is a transition towards these newer models of investing uh, where you're saying, okay, I'm not going to make billions of dollars off of a unicorn, but if I go and invest in this early stage company, but then I also invest in the supporting infrastructure and other companies around it that are going to make it succeed, um, maybe I'm not going to make a 20% return in 10 years, but maybe in 20 years I'll make you know a bunch of 1% to 2% returns off of each of those companies. Mm -hmm. So how do we start to think about the horizon of investing as far as like direct profit on your investment for social impact? Um, 
as BlackRock said, we know that impact investments are profitable. We just have to figure out how to do them appropriately. But I think more importantly than just the direct financial investment in it is if I'm making an impact investment, there are secondary economic benefits to that benefit if my investment is successful. Um, if I go build a school, if I invest, or sorry, let me actually phrase that because building a school is a terrible example. If I invest in a piece of technology that helps teachers um, better educate students in social entrepreneurship, yeah. right? How many students have I infected? Have I not infected? How many students have I affected? Maybe they've been infected with the social entrepreneurship bug, whatever. <laughs> right. How many students have then left that class and gone out and funded their own social enterprises? How much money has been invested into those enterprises? How much money has been made off them? Or how many people of those enterprises help? Like, what is the economic return of ensuring that more women go to, to school? Um, we are pretty confident at this point in time that the number one way to lift populations out of poverty is to educate women. What is the financial return on, edu on investing in, in uh, women's education? Right? Like, there are all of these kind of models of, of return and value that are created by impact financing, which don't necessarily lead to rapid returns for the investor, but have long-term societal effects that probably do also enlarge the investor's wallet down the and line. And do you see it happening? I mean, is it, are, are, are pools of capital starting to form that are more patient, that measure returns uh, both in financially and on impact measures? Um, I think they're starting to pop up. I yeah. think Acumen is obviously a very good example yeah. of, a, of a quite large fund that's investing in social impact. Uh, but alongside that, you know, UNICEF Innovation, I believe, has a $100 million fund. The World Food Program has an innovation team in Munich that only invests. They don't do for profit, they don't do nonprofit work, they just invest in for profit companies. Right. Um, the World Wildlife Fund has similar models. The Norwegian Red Cross, uh, the Norwegian government there, um, their sovereign wealth fund, I believe, just transitioned to take all of the investments they were putting into fossil fuels and transition them to impact investments or things that align with impact investments. And I think that's 11, I don't think they're investing this money, but I believe that fund is worth $11 trillion. Um, so I think there is a transition towards these types of investments and this type of understanding that um, not only is investing in social enterprises good for the people you're investing in and good for their communities, but it's also good for returns. Yep. Um, well, I sure hope you're right. Uh, we're certainly making a bet on that uh, and hope to be able to position our business model and social system design work you know, for impact investing. Uh, and so uh, we're certainly betting on that, but it needs to happen faster uh, if we're going to change the perspective in terms of solving these problems in the world. Can we talk about uh, technology a little bit? I know you're a geek, uh, and I know <laughs> What that, gave it away? <laughs> I, know you're a, I know you're a geek. I know you love technology, and I know you believe that technology is a really important part of this conversation, mm -hmm. right? How it can enable social impact. You're your most previous uh, work uh, was with Consensus, uh, you know, leading an effort on blockchain as an enabler of social impact. Tell us about technology for social impact. Oh man, uh, a lot of buzzwords, a lot of a lot of controversy. Um, I think, like fundamentally, technology is neutral, right? Like we always hear about the evils of tech, the positives of tech, but technology is a tool, tools are used for good and evil. Um, I think that's like a clarifying statement that should be made early on in any conversation about tech for impact. Um, but I think one thing that we're seeing is the ability of emerging technology to, well, in some cases create silos, but like when we're talking about tech for impact, like how do you actually break down silos of communication, information, finance, education, whatever. Um, people will look at the internet or Facebook and they'll say, you know, wow, those have caused a lot of bad things to happen in the world. Like, who needs all of this information out there? Like, I don't want my personal information shared. Um, Facebook is stealing all my data. Yes, that's true. Um, but I think oftentimes in the public's eye, we only hear about the negative implications of tech. Um, I mean, I grew up with the internet, so I don't remember what life was like before it. I was, I think I was, <laughs> I was five when my parents like started using email, so I, I really don't remember anything before it. Um, but if we think about the way emerging tech has just allowed for us to a, we're having this conversation, this conversation is going to get shared with people. Like maybe we're going to inform someone or we're going to set someone off on a path of social entrepreneurship and they're going to devise um, some new system to help ensure that, um, you know, 
we never run out of seeds on planet Earth or something like that. We're just gonna inspire something like the ability for information to travel. Uh, I think is like fundamentally, at least when I think about technology, that is so impactful when built in a positive way. Um, but also like within the blockchain movement, um, things like decentralized finance or self-sovereign identity are things that people don't necessarily equate with social impact, but having control over all of your own finances and not being reliant on banks or having to pay remittances is wildly impactful. Um, I actually, and I'll, I'll do a little shout out for, for a couple of good friends of mine. I have um, a couple of friends from Australia who have a company called Sempo. And what Sempo does is they just do super easy blockchain borders, uh, cross-border payments. Mm -hmm. um, right now they are ensuring that refugees in Northern Iraq, in Jordan, are um, uh, have the money they need to pay for their lives. Through, through cash-based transfers and are able to have food and get, be given the freedom that having money and food does for them. Um, and they're working uh, in Vanuatu to ensure the Pacific Islands have resiliency against disaster just by deploying cash. And I think when we see what emerging tech can do, whether it's helping people get access to money or building new, um, there's a company called Antura and the Letters, which is an educational game and it's a video game that helps individuals, specifically Syrian refugees who have moved to Europe or, or fled to Europe, get integrated with the community and learn the language. Um, or ensure that they're having an access to an education that they're not getting when fleeing or when they're not getting when they're in a camp. Um, and technology helps us facilitate, uh, I'm hesitant to say a sense of normalcy because these are not normal situations, but it helps ensure that children or individuals are not, um, who find themselves struck by catastrophe or disaster are not then forgotten by the world, forgotten by the system. Um, connecting them to the economy, connecting them to, the, to education or um, social networks can give a sense of community that you may not find in other places. Um, and I think, well, I, I think I've been saying I think a lot. Uh, it's very important that we, oh, I'm gonna say think again. It's very important that we think about technology as a way to connect people and think about the, the positive interactions we can facilitate. Well, I mean, I'm all in on, on your perspective. I agree with what you said. Technology is agnostic. It can uh, be either you know, for good or not good, and it's up to us as humans. Uh, to uh, to uh, proactively make sure that we're using it for the right reasons, to have a social impact, to solve the real challenges uh, that we have. So I'm optimistic about it, despite all the stories we hear, um, because I, th I see more and more people stepping up to that. How do we deploy and enable uh, technology to do it? I can't wait uh, for us to roll up our sleeves together uh, here at BIF. Uh, I think we're gonna, create a lot of impact uh, together. Uh, and so I welcome you to Team Biff. I'm grateful that you're here and I'm excited to keep learning from you and keep making me uh, feel younger, if even uh, even for a few minutes here. The shoes uh, are great. I think we should talk about the shoes. The because shoes are see, but Saul's yes, yes. wonderfully I bright them blue for you. shoes. I wore them, uh, wore them for you uh, today. Thanks for joining me here in the Business Model Sandbox, Ben. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.